From Microbe TV, this is Twevo, This Week in Evolution, episode 37, recorded on November 15th, 2018. Vincent Rackenyellow, and you're listening to the podcast on the biology behind what makes us tick. Joining me today from Salt Lake City, Nels LD. Hello again from LD Lab Studios, uh, an intrepid science outpost nestled here in the edge of the rock, Rocky Mountains. <laughs> How's that? <laughs> it's pretty good. I'm really going for it. I'm actually <laughs> foreshadowing a little bit of my excitement today, Vincent. For our guest, who has a Mountain West connection. He does, and uh, I'm really happy to have, for the second time on a Microbe TV podcast, he's the author of many books that our listeners will know, Song of the Dodo, The Reluctant Mr. Darwin Spillover. In fact, just after that book was published, we had our guest on TWIV 408, David Quammen. Welcome back. Thank you, Vincent. Great to great to be back talking with you and Nels. Nice to meet you over the phone from this other outpost in the Rocky Mountains, now Bozeman, Montana. Vincent's got snow coming down in New York, and we've got a blue sky in Bozeman, but a lot of snow on the ground. Yeah, well, and I'm a, I have something to say about that. So we're still in Salt Lake, a little south, waiting for winter to show up, and all of that moisture, uh, the high pressure has pushed it up to. Bozeman and other parts of Montana, and then to the East Coast, we're feeling a little left out so far. <laughs> Don't worry. It's okay. Yeah, the s- ski areas up here are talking about opening a, a week before Thanksgiving, which is, is unusual, right? but good. Wow. Yeah. Well, this is our first snow of the season, nor'easter, and um, it's going to be rough driving, but that's the way it goes. So the last time you were on, David, was TWIV 408 which was recorded in a BSL-4, September 2016. And yeah. we called that Boston Commons. <laughs> it's pretty good, right? <laughs> yeah, pretty good. <laughs> be careful, you get sent to the penitentiary and be punished. <laughs> <laughs> I have to say, that's Alan Dove, who was my guest, my host on that episode. And he makes up all the clever titles. When they're not clever, it's somebody else. <laughs> <laughs> He's prolific. Yeah, we have Nels and I have a have a bunch of ones for this one. Now the occasion is you've released uh, another book, which is the last one since um, so, since uh, spillover, right? Uh, there was a book in between there about Yellowstone that came from a special issue of oh, that's right. National Geographic that I did on Yellowstone, and then I expanded it into a book with photographs. This is the first sort of trade book non non visual non photograph including book my you know my latest big project right um, since spillover the tangled tree a radical new history of life so let's start with the title where did you get that from yeah okay there's a story about the title i went for 5 i probably shouldn't you know, shouldn't be talking out of shop about <laughs> my my uh, saintly editor uh, and publisher, Simon & Schuster. But um, I went for five years with a working title, a different working title of this book that I loved, which was The Tree of Life is Not a Tree. Ah. And every time somebody asked me, the scientists that I was talking to about molecular phylogenetics and horizontal gene transfer, they'd say, oh, yeah, oh, okay, yeah, that's a good title. And everybody else would say, Huh? Well, huh? And I finally delivered the the revised manuscript of the book um, about a I don't know a little, little less than a year ago I can't remember, and uh, and my editor um, and my agent, uh, both of whom are smart and both of whom I trust, said, "For the love of God, would you please get a different title?" <laughs> um, I, why? And they said, well, it's paradoxical. Well, of course it's paradoxical. That's the point. Well, people, uh, general readers, it's kind of uncomfortable paradox. Okay, so no paradox. So I, um, at their suggestion, um, urgent suggestion, I came up with a different title, The Tangled Tree, which is not as striking, as far as I'm concerned, as The Tree of Life is Not a Tree. But it allowed me to take the word life out of my title and put it in my very modest and unassuming subtitle. Mm. <laughs> I see. Uh, 
a radical, radical. New history of life. So I'm, uh, that's how it happened, and I'm very happy that they persuaded me to do that because I like the combination. Well, when I saw it, I, I immediately recognized it because, as you probably know, having um, interviewed Bill Martin, he, mm. I, I don't know if he was the first, but he was one of the first to, to build a tangled tree of bacteria, archaea, and eukaryotes. Yeah. And you have that in your book, actually. Yeah, yeah. I think I even have his image, which he let me use. Very, very interesting guy. So I immediately recognized, oh, he must be writing about this Bill Martin idea. So, But I'm sure people, now, would you have picked that up? I guess you would, right? Well, and I think that idea of the tangling, I mean, this goes back all the way to Darwin. So the tangled bank, isn't that part of the lore there? There is the tangled bank. There's a book, uh, quite a good book by, I think, Nathaniel Comfort called The Tangled Field, which is about Barbara McClintock. Mm -hmm. Carl Zimmer did a textbook on evolution. He's a, a, um, a co-author, I think, uh, called The Tangled Bank, taken from Darwin's quote, although I think in The Origin of Species, it's actually an entangled bank, mm -hmm. um, but still tangled bank is sort of Darwin's. Um, so, yeah, there are all those precedents to it. Uh, in this case, it's the tangled tree. Um, and I didn't bother to reference all those precedents specifically, but that's certainly, you know, smart people like you guys caught the echoes. I don't know. I don't know. <laughs> great, I, for yeah. Speaking for myself, I, I'm just... <laughs> I'm not sure, sure I'm smart, but just remember. <laughs> <laughs> well, and I liked it. I like that original title too, David. So, is that a quote actually from one of the kind of main heroes of this book, Lynn Margulis, who said the tree of life is not a tree, or is that no, no? As far as not, I know, it's not a quote from anybody. It's oh, just, interesting. It's just what what the way I th thought of it. Mm. Yeah. Um, uh, but uh, but Lynn, yeah, Lynn Margulis is um, is an important character in the book and and her ideas are important. We can talk about those. Yeah, we'll get to them for sure. Mm -hmm. um, so that's interesting. You said you had a different title. I always wondered if the final title is throughout the writing or it ends up at the end. So you told us that. That's kind of interesting. Yeah. And it's, an, it's, uh, it's a saga with writing books. I don't know if you've written books, Vincent, but you know, you spend five years or eight years on a book and you have a title and then uh, something happens at the last minute or your editor pleads with you or something. I've had... Um, I've had this experience several times before where I wrote a book thinking this is the title and then circumstances or mm -hmm. people that I trust said, no, that is not the title. That can't be the title. You mentioned my book, The Reluctant Mr. Darwin. That wasn't the title of that book while I wrote yeah, it either. Interesting. Hmm. I haven't written any – well, I've written textbooks and those are easy. <laughs> but I'm <laughs> yourself. <laughs> I, I am planning to write a book and I have a couple of titles and I've – I have a publisher and I've discussed them and when I yeah. when I when I tell them they don't say anything so it worries me. <laughs> yeah. Well, that's no that's a that's common. People what anything you can share with Nels and me? Titles? Yeah. 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 All right, so it's it's going to be about viruses, right? Mm -hmm. So one potential title is I virus because that's the theme of the book that you know, we're all made of first person singular I pronoun. Virus, yeah. right? And then yeah. I, I had that for a while, and then my latest one was in the company of viruses. Okay. I like that one. So those, like, are, two, those I, are the two I, I like, I like them. I like them. Mm -hmm. I like them. iVirus, um, iRobot. <laughs> right. iPhone. <laughs> <laughs> and the idea would be, I'm taking a, a page from your book, David. I'm going to have a chapter on viruses and a chapter on the people who did the work. Because mm -hmm. you you told me once, if you want to write about science, you write about the people who do it. Yeah, yeah. Because that's, yes. that, that's what you do, obviously. So Yeah, yeah, yeah that's a guiding principle for me. So yeah. uh, this book is seems to me driven by Carl Woese. And mm -hmm. I, I want to know if that's true and how you latched on to him. Yes, uh, it is. He's the central character. I call him, I don't know if I call him this in the book, but I call him when I talk about this, the most important biologist of the 20th century that you've never heard of. Um, <laughs> and, you know, you guys have heard of him, but a lot of people, even among my um, evolutionary biologist friends, they never heard of Carl Woese. Uh, and I had never heard of him before 2013, spring of 2013. I got onto this path. Kind of picked up this thread. Um, 
because I started reading about horizontal gene transfer. I don't know if it was in online, in blogs, maybe Carl Zimmer wrote something about a study, maybe Ed Yong wrote something about a study, horizontal gene transfer, maybe I saw it somewhere else, read a couple of journal papers, and my first reaction was, wait, what? Hor- mm. well, horiz- horiz- no, that's not possible. What about the Weissman barrier? What about this? What about that? No, that's that. And then the more I read, the more I saw, yeah, this is a thing. This is documented. And it's not just among bacteria, although, although it's most prominent and abundant among bacteria. Mm. Um, and so I decided I had a new publisher, and uh, the publisher wanted me wanted to publish me and then the question of which book was the secondary question and I gave um, Simon and Schuster three options on the back of an envelope essentially <laughs> and they said we'll take the one about the tree of life and um, if um, if you could see me you would see me slapping my forehead to to communicate what that felt like when they said that. Uh, My reaction was, oh my God, they picked the hardest one. How, yes, this is fascinating, but how in the world am I going to write a book about molecular phylogenetics that people are going to want to read? That's going to be a page turner. Um, And uh, part of the answer to that question was then I read a little farther and I discovered this character, Carl Woes, this guy sitting, this spider sitting in the middle of this big, complex web of ideas and research and discoveries. Carl Woese in Urbana, Illinois, most important biologist of the 20th century that I had never heard of. Mm -hmm. And so, I started looking into his life. I read read a very, very good book, a, a wonderful book about the history of this, but a book that was not written for my audience, but written for me and you two guys, um, you know, a sort of a deep in the weeds, very technical I suppose you'd call it academic book, called New Foundations of Evolution by the great science historian Jan Sapp. Mm-hmm. And, uh, and I learned a lot from that, and then I saw who some of the players were, and I said, well, yeah, this is not my template, but this Jan Sapp's book helped me a lot in seeing the different places where this subject went. And um, and so, from the beginning, I knew that, that Woes was going to be Sort of the central character for Doolittle was going to be important. Lynn Margulis was going to be important. Um, Darwin was going to be important, and uh, a few, a few others. Who, and uh, uh, Oswald Avery and mm-hmm. Fred Griffith, and et cetera, et cetera. So I saw, I saw characters, and then I said, okay, here's a constellation. Here's the way I work. There's a constellation of ideas, and I think if you view these ideas as a constellation, then a bigger meaning emerges from this group of ideas. Below the constellation of ideas is this group of people who generated those ideas, made those discoveries, and below that are these narrative lines, the stories of who those people were and how they made those discoveries. So, then I knew it was just a matter of finding a sinuous but continuous line through all those sort of dots on the intellectual map. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and David, can I ask, so one of those names you mentioned, yeah. of course, is Darwin, kind of stretching back near the beginning of the story. I'm curious, is it actually difficult to write about Charles Darwin? I mean, he's garnered so much attention, including, obviously, your own previous work. How do you say something new about him? How do you say something new? Well, uh, it's not easy, um, and it's and it's dangerous to say the old things. There, there's only so many times you can repeat the story of, of Darwin and Wallace and the co-discovery of natural selection and the arrangement, the delicate arrangement of sharing, you know, first publication credit. But there are other things about Darwin. You know, he lived a long life and he did a lot of work, did an amazing amount of work for a guy who was working with pen and paper and, and, and letters. Um, uh, so, there are things still to be said, and he's he's got this wonderful sketch in his B notebook in 1838 of a of a tree of life, an evolutionary tree, really the first recognizable evolutionary tree of life. So, um, so I went back to that, and I knew I had to tell the story of that drawing. Uh, what it meant for Darwin, where it came from, what preceded it, and what came after it. Um, and, you know, Darwin is, uh, I love Darwin. He's so, he's complicated. He's, he's so honest. Um, he's so 
anguished uh, so that it's tricky, but it's always a, a, a privilege to put Dar- Charles Darwin in as a character. Now, as I sent uh, David a tattoo yesterday of the little tree. <laughs> oh, mm, the, I, yeah. the I think, yeah, it's become a, an iconic um, sort of visualization. Now, now uh, that tattoo, you were in the room when I took that picture. It was up in... Oh, that's... Oh, I remember now. Yeah, so when we were, we were doing... London, an epi- London, Ontario, right? Correct. Sure. Yeah, yeah, that's right. The um, origins of Twivo, actually. At that that's when I asked Nels if he wanted to do a, <laughs> an evolution podcast, right? That's right. And I think it was at the same watering hole where um, one of our colleagues came up and showed off her tattoo of Darwin's, I think. Yep. I was, and I took, that's the picture I sent David I see. Yesterday. I thought you actually did. You, had, did I, I, did ahead you ahead. guys show her, show her your uh, virus tattoos? In <laughs> we don't have, I don't have any. Do you, do you know? No, I don't uh, currently, oh. but, you know, always open to. So it's funny you should say that, David, <laughs> because I was at a meeting this summer and I gave a talk and I, I talked about my love for viruses. And at the end I said, I've done everything except I don't have a virus tattoo. <laughs> and someone came up to me afterwards at the bar, a young woman and showed me her tattoo on her forearm, her virus tattoo. Oh, okay. There you go. Well, it's not too late, Vincent. It's not too late. And actually I think Carl Zimmer has a fondness for science related tattoos, even yeah, maybe a yeah. website. You yeah. Could... Yeah. He's right. He's collected information on that. Hasn't he? Uh-huh. For sure. Maybe you could be an ent- late entry. Late breaking. So Carl and I are doing something together on stage. Speaking of evolution mm-hmm. um, subject, we're, Carl and I are, are going to do something on stage at Harvard in March, I think, on as part of their Evolution Matters series. Cool. That should Very be cool. fun. Yeah. 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 Now, as I interrupted you, you, you talk. Oh, no, not at all. So I just think, I mean, that's, it's really interesting. And I think, well, actually, this idea of Darwin's place and how Carl Woos, who's sort of one of the main protagonists in David's great book, um, how there's some mm-hmm. tension there. I think that we'll kind of return to that. Yeah. Well, yeah. The other reason I had to put Car- uh, put Darwin in at the beginning is that toward the end of the book, what emerges in woes, among other things, is during his cranky late years, is is a a fierce hatred for Darwin, a dismissiveness, to put it lightly, toward Darwin, mm-hmm. and um, and in order to underst- in order to understand him in those later years, you kind of need to engage with that, and in order to understand that, you need to understand a little bit about how. You know Darwin's um, forays in the tree of life business. So, David, why did it start out as a tree? Um, which you mean the whole idea of? Yeah, the tree of life. You know, the it started before well, Darwin, as you say in your book. Yes, right? yeah. It's I mean, it's an ancient um, metaphor. Uh, you know, it's in the Torah. It's in Greek literature. It's in various places um, and different meanings. It's in the New Testament, I think, um, where you know Christ is the tree of life. In the Old Testament, uh, it's got other meanings. Um, in different cultures around the world, there are trees of life. I found a tree of life from um, somewhere in Eastern Europe, um, very early, um, early modern image so um so it was always around it meant a lot of different things uh and in the centuries immediately preceding darwin it started to be an information storage heuristic Mm -hmm. uh you know the tree of life i I talk about that in some couple of my early chapters um augustin augier uh who in the, I think it was the 18th century, talk about memories now, can I can remember <laughs> what I wrote in, in my most recent book. Um, he's using the tree of life as a way to organize plant diversity. Mm-hmm. Uh, mm-hmm. You know, these, these creatures, these plants on this limb um, are related to one another, and over here on this other limb, you've got these, this, another family of plants that are related to one another. So, it was, it was information storage. And information storage, you know, that was part of one of the most important enterprises of um, natural history in the pre-Darwin era. You know, that's what Linnaeus was all about. Binomial um, Latin names for creatures, that was part of information classification, right. storage and retrieval. Um, so, that was what the Tree of Life meant right up to Lamarck and Darwin. And then Lamarck had his um, uh, sort of inchoate but 
prescient theory of evolution. And he had sort of a, people were talking about ladders of life too, you know, from primitive um, creatures Mm -hmm. climbing the ladder up to, you know, the higher close unquote, quote unquote creatures. And then man at the top, Um, there was this idea of a ladder of life. Um, But as, as creatures became more and more diverse creatures were recognized and a ladder was too linear and didn't store enough information, started to spread out sideways with limbs and um, and Lamarck had sort of a combination of that that was a kind of a ladder that had these uh, sort of horizontal jogs and jigs um, and uh, that's not exactly recognizable as the earliest evolutionary tree of life I, I still think that Darwin's is is the one that says to you okay now for the mm. first time we're seeing that the history of life's diversification is shaped like a tree. I really love the history of the trees that you you put forth in the first part of the book. And I have notation. I have some notes here, and it's funny. In the old days, I would have said page so and so. Since I read on a Kindle, it says eight percent, but that doesn't mean anything because everybody is reading on a different device, right? So percentage yeah. is useless. So yeah, I love Kindles, but for travel. But that's one of the things I don't like about them. Yeah, you can't uh, say on page so and so. But what I loved was um, when you you gave credit to Francis Crick for using molecules, right? Oh yeah, yeah. To build a tree. Well, yeah, you know, evolution. Evolution is a historical science, and to talk about evolution without talking about the history of the discoveries seems to me crazy. And I love history of science, history of evolutionary biology, history of molecular phylogenetics. Francis Crick, 1958, his great paper on protein synthesis as a a parenthetical toss-off, he says, oh yeah, maybe we could use molecules to to discern um, stages and and important nexes in the history of life, too. Um, And uh, that rang a bell. Um, with uh, with Carl Woese, who was became a friend of of Crick's, uh, and uh, and then I also mention um, who was it Linus Pauling and mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. and uh, Zuckerberg Zuckerberg Zucker Candle Zucker Candle not Mark Zuckerberg <laughs> <laughs> uh, Zucker Candle yeah uh, and they published a paper also it was uh, again on something else it was on the molecular clock I think yep. that was Zucker Candle and Pauling 1965 on the molecular clock. Mm-hmm. Parenthetically, they said, well, maybe there could also be something called protein taxonomy um, using, you know, in their case, they were talking about proteins and not nucleic acids, not RNA or DNA, but um, maybe we could use proteins as um, as, uh, as sort of archaeological records of um, relatedness and divergence. Right. So, and I guess just to say, I mean, up to that stage in that sort of massive transition, the way these trees were being built were based on morphological characters mostly. So if you had like a matching or some very similar morphology of a femur or another bone or something else, that was sort of the basis of this. Yeah. Yeah. Right? Until this came along mm-hmm. un- until, until these guys made these suggestions. But before that, yeah, taxonomy um, classification was, was all about morphology. And, uh, and then Woe's really, um, he, so he, he, there were these suggestions from Crick, from Zucker, Kandel, and and Pauling, but it was really Woes, Carl Woes, who said, "Okay, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, f- I've got an idea of using one molecule, one very elemental, deeply buried, universal molecule that exists in all forms of cellular life on Earth, and I'm gonna use that as my Rosetta Stone, and I'm gonna sequence it or sequence parts of it as much as I can sequence in, you know, 1974, 75." Um, and uh, use that to try and understand events 3.5, 3.8 billion years ago, the earliest, deepest limbs branching off the trunk in the tree of life. Now, that, that's one of the things that made woes important. I love when you start talking about the ribosome, so you're trying to put what woes did in context. Right? What is this ribosome? Yeah. You tell the story of Brenner realizing that it's a tape reader. Yeah. And you know yeah, the, this big meeting at a this big moment at a science meeting, right? 
Right, right. That's a great moment, a great, a great eureka moment. And and I the the I've seen that several places. It's in I believe it's in Horace Freeland Judson's great book, The Eighth Day of Creation. Mm-hmm. It's also in Matt Ridley's wonderful little book on Francis Crick, Matt's biography of Crick, uh, where he tells the story that they're sitting in this room and they're talking about the ribosome. It was they're talking about the translation um, process of translating you know, messenger RNA into proteins. How does this work? How does this work? Well, it's got something to do with the ribosome. Are all these things inside the the ribosome? What does the ribosome do? And uh, Matt describes they're sitting there and suddenly Brenner sees it and Crick sees him see it. Hmm. And they leave everybody else in the room behind with this spurt of of dialogue and they're suddenly roughing out, oh, the ribosome, it doesn't contain information at all. It translates information like a tape reader translates marks on a tape into sound, except it translates messenger RNA into protein. It's a tape reader. (laughs) And and then I, I say, I say it, you know, I feel like we need to, because a lot of people tape. What's what's yeah, tape? That's Who's right. This tape recorder. Tape. You know, a tape recorder now is 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 a metaphor. You talk about are we are we taping this yeah. um, this conversation? Yes, but we're not using tape. Um, so I say, um, you know, it might be more helpful now for people to think of it as a three D printer. The yeah, ribosome. I love that. That's I great. Do. I do yeah. too. And I think that kind of gets at this, you know, challenge is how do you take something like molecular phylogenetics and actually reach a broad audience? It's th- through a little bit of that storytelling. And, storytelling and, and yeah. metaphor. Yeah. 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 Narr- that, narrative and metaphor. Hmm. The two, the, the, that's the, you know, that's the saw and the hammer of science writing for the general public. And one thing you do, David, is you say, now this is going to hurt. <laughs> and then you tell them something and say, okay, now you can forget it. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah, I do do that. Yeah. <laughs> well, that's partly, that reflects um, a, another general, very general operating principle of mine, which is that when you're writing about this stuff, when you're writing about anything, but it, particularly if you're writing about science, complicated science, the history of science, talk to the reader like you're having a phone conversation with a friend. Mm. Don't address the reader like an audience of 400 you know, nameless faces. Um, use think think in terms of the second person singular pronoun. Mm-hmm. That's mm-hmm. your audience, yeah. and so that's that's what I uh, I do with greater or lesser success. I, it's, it's for others to judge, but that's what I'm trying to do is address the reader as my second person singular acquaintance or friend. That's why I think it's funny on your website after the intro you write. This will not. The rest of this website will not be in the third person. <laughs> oh yeah, I'm writing about. Yeah, I started off saying Dave, David David Quammen, blah blah blah. Um, is a you know an elderly white guy with a brown mustache, whatever. Um, and then and then I admit that okay, yeah, it's it's me, it's me. I'm right, t- I'm talking right, about right. myself. Okay. At one point, you talk about how difficult it was for woes to sequence, and Nels and I have contrasting additions. So, you know, Woes was sequencing 10, 20 bases of ribosomal RNA. It took him a long time to do that. I did poliovirus, the whole thing, 7,440 bases in 1980. It took me one year. Mm. And nowadays you could do it in 30 minutes. Yeah. And Nels, what did you do yesterday? Well, yeah, so I was just telling Vincent, we cranked out about three gigabases yesterday, just um, outside my office. But I wanted to actually, I wanted to kind of reflect on that for a minute. So even though Carl Woese was using, you know, this really primitive technology and dangerous technology, actually, yeah. as you describe it, um, the, you know, the insights, even though it was such a crude tool, the insights were, you know, revolutionary, radical new view of yes. life. And yet, Re- I can, yes, absolutely. Yep. Yeah, and I can guarantee, so... Vincent, when you did, it took a year, but when you did polio virus, that was huge. That was a big step forward, fundamental step forward in virology. So even though I can kind of, you know, cross my arms and said we did three gigabases yesterday, <laughs> that's isn't going <laughs> to, this isn't going to yeah. sort of fog the mirror on a fundamental insight. I think so. It, it's a fun project. It's actually a collaboration with one of my science buddies, Sarah Sawyer, who's at um, Colorado Boulder. 
We're sequencing a little stretch of the owl monkey genome for an interesting reason, but it's not going to sort of change the game the way some of these other insights did with previous technology. I think it's just fun or important, I guess, to keep an eye on that. It's not the sort of uh, advancement of technology, but it's like how you're using it, the questions you're asking and what you're gaining from. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, well, that's probably the way science generally moves, right? You know, there's a lurch forward and then there's a filling in, mm-hmm. and that filling in work is is really important. Uh, among other things, it, it supports, validates the lurch forward, but then, you know, time passes and, and somebody else is given the, the blessing of being able to make another lurch forward. And then, and then other people um, say, oh, yeah, that's a very interesting idea. I think I'll test that in my lab. Um, and they, they do some of the filling in. But with Woes back in 1977 and with, with Vincent in 1980, um, you know, that, uh, th- that was heroic stuff. I mean, Woes, he was crawling across the Bonneville salt flats on his hands and knees in terms of getting sequence information. Um, and I quote him at one point um, in the book saying, you know, he would, um, he would frequently go walk home from work saying, well, Woes, have you destroyed your brain again today? <laughs> um, simply because of the, the laborious effort, not that he was dealing with intricate, challenging concepts. He was dealing with just the nuts and bolts of trying to figure out what these different um, galloping amoebae on the, on the films that he was getting from electrophoresis, these little fragments of, of RNA, uh, what their sequences were, just to try and, and determine what the data were let alone later figuring out what the data meant. Um, uh, it was exciting, I think, an exciting time for him. You write, ex- uh, they involved explosive liquids, high voltages, radioactive phosphorus, at least one form of pathogenic bacteria, and a loosely improvised set of safety procedures. That sounds like a lab I would love. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, but maybe a, a lab for reckless young people. I mean, I talked to Mitch Sogan about this, um, now a very you know, senior scientist at Woods Hole, uh, and he was Carl Woese's lab handyman as well as his grad student. Mitch was putting this stuff together, and he said to me, God, we should be dead. Um, yeah, yeah. well, the things have changed, I tell you, in terms of just safety. When I was a student, there wasn't much just like in Woes's time, and it's much different nowadays. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Radioactive phosphorus. Every every other Monday, they'd get a shipment of radioactive phosphorus yep. in this lead container. They called a pig. Yep. What was the point of that? Lead container protected the, the people who delivered the radioactive phosphorus. Didn't protect the person who opened the, the lead container. <laughs> That's Man, we right. used to have a lot of those pigs lying around. They're all gone. Nobody uses it anymore. No. So, you know, yeah. Non-radioactive. Probably you don't have any radioactive in your lab right now. We don't. So we're doing some of the same techniques, some southern blotting, northern blotting, but it's all uh, yeah. fluorescent probes now. And, yep, yep. Different era. Yep. So, but speaking, David, of the front lines um, in sort of the dangerousness, I wanted to bring up um, a character who kind of maybe is overlooked um, in a lot of the story, but it was sort of fundamental to it. This is Lisa Bonin. Um, who is well, she, and why? Why is Linda she? Bon- uh, sorry, Linda, sorry, yeah. How, Linda why was Bonin. She? Yeah, she's mm-hmm. she's great. Uh, I was very glad to um, be able to tell her story a bit. She was um, uh, she walked into Woz's lab one day in Urbana, Illinois, and and said, you know, I need a job. You got anything? Uh, she, I think maybe she had a um, maybe a master's degree in biology at that point, and. Um, and he said, yeah, yeah, uh, Mitch Sogan is leaving me, and I need a new person to be my uh, my nuts and bolts um, lab tech. Um, so he trained her, and she told me, I tracked her down. Uh, where Where is she? Um, um, Ottawa, Ottawa, University of Ottawa, I believe. Um, I tracked her down and, and had a nice interview with her. She said, yeah, Woes was a great teacher. Uh, he taught me how to do all these things, you know, extracting. We should double back and extracting what extracting 16s ribosomal rna there we now we've named we've named the um the rosetta stone molecule that was one of woes's great discoveries it, it, he had the insight that this particular molecule 16s ribosomal rna a structural rna in the ribosome that was the one that he would sequence that would tell him about the the history of of life from the beginning 
Um, so uh, he trained Linda Bonin to do things like extract, you know, culturing bacteria, feeding them radioactive phosphorus so that they, their bits of um, of RNA would show up on on an X-ray film, um, separating the RNA that molecule of RNA from everything else, uh, and then um, busting it into pieces with enzymes, particular enzymes, and um, and then running the electrophoresis using the method that had sort of been pioneered by Fred Sanger in England, but ad- adapting it and improving on it for their own purposes. So Linda Bonin is doing that. She does it for, I don't know how long, maybe three or four years for woes. And uh, she's on some of his most important papers. She's credited as an author, as she should be. Um, uh, but, you know, she's a lab tech. And then uh, her husband at the time moves to Nova Scotia to take a job at Dalhousie University in in Halifax, Nova Scotia. She goes along with him, and she gets there, and she, again, wants some kind of employment. And uh, Woes says to her, well, why don't you go see my old friend Ford Doolittle. He's got a lab there and he's doing this kind of thing. He's doing, you know, um, molecular work. Maybe he's interested in, in sequencing. She walks into Ford's lab and says, Woes sent me. <laughs> got any got any got any work? And and he says, Yeah, you know how to do that stuff that Carl is doing? Yeah, let's do that. So so then Ford Doolittle, um, with the crucial help of Linda Bonin, starts doing 16S RNA sequencing in his lab, starts doing molecular phylogenetics. Among other things, he confirms Lynn Margulis's endosymbiosis hypothesis, showing that on molecular grounds, it is true, it is accurate to believe that chloroplasts in plants uh, are descended from captured bacteria. He could even then say, what kind of bacteria? Cyanobacteria. Look at their genome. The genome is so close. Uh, the genome of a chloroplast is so close to cyanobacteria and a hell of a lot less close to the genomes of that particular plant. So Ford and Linda Bonin mm. confirmed endosymbiosis using um, Woese's uh, molecular sequencing approach. So in a way, the the scientists themselves are tangled in this book because you just told Linda's story. There's also Saul Spiegelman. He plays a big role in this as well. Yeah, yeah. Because he had left right. behind, Ford. he came to Columbia and left behind all the sequencing apparatus in Illinois, right? That's right. <laughs> yeah, that's right. He left behind the sequencing stuff. He was working on RNA, including the monster RNA molecule that seemed to be replicating itself in in vitro like a living creature. Um, Spiegelman, Ford Doolittle, came, uh, grew up in Urbana, Illinois, and then came back there to do a postdoc mm. in Spiegelman's lab. And uh, I can't remember the the sequence, the time sequence. But in the meantime, oh yeah. So then, s- soon after that, Spiegelman got an offer from Columbia. I think it was left Urbana, left behind this all the, these these tools, these machines, this apparatus for sequencing. And Woes said, "Well, I'm going to use this stuff, but I have no idea how to operate it." And he got a guy. Then he wrote to, I think he wrote to Fred Sanger and said, "You got anybody?" Uh, in your lab who's coming might want to come to the U.S. and and teach me how to do the kind of thing that you're doing. And uh, and so a fellow did, uh, Dave, oh, I can't remember his name. Um, just, I wish I could give credit to him. Um, but another important character, and he brought some of Fred Sanger's um, sequencing ideas to Urbana, to Woes' lab. Woes had this equipment that Saul Spiegelman had left behind, and, and this – um, this undergraduate on a swimming scholarship walks into his lab and has a conversation with him. That's Mitchell Sogan, mm. and these pieces come together. And it's, it's it's this is what I love about science history. You know, it's it's not all determined. It's not all rational. A lot of this stuff happens happens by accident, serendipity. Um, things and people come together, and um, and synergy occurs. Is that Dave Bishop you're thinking of? Yeah, yeah, Dave Bishop. Yeah. That's the beauty of a Kindle. I can search. You can find yeah, it. Yeah, there you go. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. There, Vincent, there's a, there's an index in the back of the printed copy, you know. <laughs> yeah, I know. I remember this. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I, I have a Kindle that I use for travel, and I just finished reading Carl um, Zimmer's uh, wonderful 
book on heredity. She has her mother's laugh. Mm-hmm. I bought it in hardback, but it's so huge that I got tired of carrying it on airplanes. So I bought the Kindle version too. No, it's great for travel, but uh, yeah. and you, there are a lot of good things about it. But in a conversation like ours, it's hard to reference what page you're talking about. Yeah. I knew Spiegelman a little bit. He was here at Columbia when I came. I came here in really? 1982, and he was still here. And in fact, I I met him, and he was he actually provided some money to get me here. Um, I spoke well, did with you him. Ever, did you ever work in his lab? I never did. No, uh, he, he died shortly afterwards, and I really never spoke to him when he was here. But you know, we had a had a conversation, and I was very tortured because I would say things and he wouldn't respond, right? <laughs> he would just listen. So I just kept talking. <laughs> and uh, then a couple of weeks later, he called me when I was back in Boston and uh, said, what do we need to get you here? And I told him, and he, and he helped. So that's what I knew of Spiegelman. Wow, good for him. Good. <laughs> that's nice. It's a nice memory. Yeah. But uh, Ford Doolittle uh, said that he was sort of a spooky guy, too. Yeah, you say that in the book. He would creep up behind people and... Yeah. He wore crepe shoes so you couldn't hear him. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. And Ford would be aspirating um, radioactive phosphorus or something like that. And he'd almost <laughs> choke. So the the outcome of, of Woese's work were this idea, there are three domains, bacteria, archaea, and eukaryotes. And a, a good part of your book is dedicated to all the opposition he had and it's it, for for me today anyway. It's strange to think that because that we all accept that. Yes, yeah. Well, and that was yeah, that was his first big discovery, his first big splash. Um, Woes and Fox, nineteen seventy seven. Hey, there is a third major kingdom of life. Well, no, actually, let's call it a domain. Um, and these things that look like bacteria through a microscope turn out not to be bacteria at all if you sequence them. And in fact, they're more, a little more closely related to eukaryotes. Um, so suddenly there's three kingdoms of life, um, according to him. And there was a lot of resistance to that, particularly in the U.S., because he made the announcement by press release and not by pub- before the published article. Yeah. Uh, and people thought, this is, you know, this is junk science. What kind of... What is, what is this, you know, um, announcement by press release? He did that because there was pressure on him, internal pressure. He had reasons for wanting to do that, but also pressure, I think, from NASA, who was one of his chief funders, and maybe the NSF also. Um, but uh, he took a lot of flack for this discovery. People were reluctant to believe it. They thought it was, you know, they thought it was baloney, uh, except in Germany. Uh, German um, biochemist and molecular biologist who had been looking at uh, methanogens in particular had a suspicion that they were very peculiar bacteria indeed. So when he said, well, they're not bacteria at all, hmm. um, people like uh, Otto Candler and, uh, and Wolfram Zillig said, yeah, yeah, we, we agree. Uh, and he became, he became, you know, Tom Waits is big in Japan. Um, and Woes became big in Germany before he was big in the U.S. Um, uh, but there remained a lot of resistance. Lynn Margulis, along with Robert Whitaker, had proposed a five kingdoms um, tree of life. Uh, the old, the, the canonical version was two kingdoms, and and Stanier and Van Neel, the great um, um, cell biologists, had um, essentially established the 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 guiding dichotomy uh, of prokaryotes and eukaryotes. Um, and that that was firmly entrenched. And so Woes was saying, well, prokaryotes is a nonsense category because it contains, it's, you know, what's the term, paraphyletic um, mm-hmm. or polyphyletic? It's, it contain, anyway, it contains creatures that are not as closely related to each other as one group of them is to eukaryotes, so it's it's nonsense, um, and people didn't didn't like that. They they were they they were reluctant to give up that category of prokaryotic forms mm-hmm. of mm-hmm. life. Yeah. Well, and it sounds like part of the tension from um, was the rollout of this idea, as you're describing with the press releases, the NASA yeah, yeah. news conference. So that kind of led to a question I wanted to ask: was how important is it for scientists to be able to communicate? You say, I think something about that that um, Woes lacked the facility as a verbal explainer. 
he couldn't communicate with the reporters and that this then kind of the, his message got garbled or it was rolled out in a way that it was not well received. Right. Right. That was part of the problem. And uh, one of his colleagues from that time, Ralph Wolf, who now is 96, I hope he's okay. Hope you're well, Ralph. Um, um, who was, was that, it was sort of a, a, a co-worker with him on that. It was um, an expert on the methanogens. Um, uh, Ralph Wolf was horrified by the way this discovery was covered in the press, this announcement of the Archaea, um, because, um, you know, the press release came and then the New York Times covered it, did a pretty good job. Washington Post covered it, did a pretty good job, still kind of groping. And then, you know, the Lebanon, Ohio Daily Journal and the, and the Chicago Tribune and a lot of other papers got a hold of it and said, you know, Martian like organisms found in Urbana, Illinois, and uh, creatures that are older than rock found, um, and all this confused hype baloney came out, uh, and that made it harder. Um, Ralph Wolf was was co author with Woes on some of the papers that led up to this announcement. He apparently he was not on the the the, the, the the Archaea announcement paper, um, but he started getting phone calls. He got a call from Salvador Luria saying, you know, the g- great noblest mm-hmm. um, cell biologist, molecular biologist, um, saying, Ralph, what is this bullshit that's coming out of <laughs> Carl Woese's lab? You got to distance yourself from this quackery as fast as you can or you're ruined. Mm-hmm. And, uh, and Wolf said, well, Salvador, have you read the paper? Mm-hmm. Well, no, I haven't seen the paper yet, but I saw the, <laughs> you know, it's in the Boston Globe, and it's nonsense. Yeah, wow. <sighs> so they had to deal with that. Hmm. So, I, in kind of curiosity, is this also just as a challenge, even for writers, science communicators, maybe even your book, The Tangled Tree? I think I saw some coverage that might have got felt like it was a little, not on nearly a scale as this of a misinterpretation, but this idea that you can sort of torch the tree of life or uproot it or oh, cut yeah. it down. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, it's tricky. And your original... Uh, your question, Nels, was, you know, how is it important for scientists to be communicators? And it certainly is. Um, and yet, um, I think, and I've said this before, uh, I think one of the, scientists don't have to beat themselves up if they're not good writers for the general public. Jo- your jobs are hard enough already. Um, but part of communicating your science to the general public, one channel of that, is to be hospitable sometimes to guys like me, <laughs> guys that belong to my – guys and gals that belong to my guild, my level on the food chain. Um, say yes to the interview f- with the journalist, mm-hmm. uh, but don't say yes to every interview. Be picky and choosy and try and invest your time and your explaining uh, and your trust in science writers who take the trouble to get it right and let them do the writing. Um, I think that's, uh, that's important. But even, you know, even um, for somebody like me writing about this technical stuff, um, you get reviewed and sometimes, you know, I'm a book reviewer too, so I, I'm very reluctant to complain about reviews. But, there, you know, this, this book, The Tangled Tree, there have been some reviews that kind of um, – let me just say they they stated my case in a way slightly different from how I've stated my case mm-hmm. about Woes's challenge to Darwin and what what does re- represent a challenge to old fashioned uh, 20th century neo Darwinism in terms of the tree of life and and what remains unchallenged mm-hmm. natural selection remains unchallenged but the idea that um, evolution proceeds only by divergence that is challenged and we now recognize that. Um, yes, most of the history of life has a strongly tree-like signal, and yet it's not a categorical truth that the history of life is shaped like a tree because tree branches don't converge, and the branches of the history of life, some of them, including some very important ones, do converge, Mm -hmm. and that's horizontal gene transfer and endosymbiosis. Mm -hmm, Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. So uh, let's move on to uh, Lynn Margulis a bit, who you, in contrast to Woes, you did meet uh, Lynn yeah, and spoke yeah. with her. And yeah. she, she, you know, she, as you said, she was a big reason why the endosymbiosis theory uh, moved forward. And, but she did not care, seem to care for Woes' three domain idea, right? 
No, she and Woes did not get along well. Um, very different personalities with very different um, commitments to different theories. Um, and so, yeah, she had her five kingdoms um, view of life based m- mostly on morphology, microscopy, and electron microscopy. Mm. And then Woes came up with his three kingdoms schema based on uh, molecular data. Uh, and so they were at loggerheads and their personalities. They did, I, I don't know. I don't know how many times, if at all, they met. But um, I, as I say in the book, I found one piece of correspondence in the Woes archives where um, a dean from um, the college at the University of Chicago, of which Lynn Margulis was an alum, mm-hmm. wrote. He this dean wrote to Woes saying, "Hey, we're considering." Um, Dr. Margulis for an honorary degree, an honorary doctorate. Uh, would you write a, like a letter, letter? Would you write a letter of recommendation? And the correspondence is there, private correspondence in the archives, when he, where he's saying, "No, no, I don't, I, I don't respect her work. Uh, uh, and if you want letters of recommendation, you've come to the wrong guy." Mm. Do you, Do you understand why she didn't buy into his three domain? Did she not get the molecular? data or was it just something else well it was not her realm molecular data i'm sure yeah. she was capable of understanding it you know if she read his papers and seeing seeing the you know the the basis of his argument uh, but i think she was she was deeply committed to five kingdoms she was deeply committed to um morphology and microscopy um and um and like um uh, another great um uh, you know, 20th century um, Darwinian, Ernst Meyer, um, she was unwilling to say that these differences in a particular um, gene that codes for a particular molecule called 16S ribosomal RNA trump all other forms of information. And so, these things that um, look like prokaryotes and act like prokaryotes and smell like prokaryotes mm. and quack like prokaryotes, namely the archaea, are not prokaryotes. She, it was, she was just, I think, reluctant to, mm. to make that leap, as, as was Ernst Meyer. Ernst Meyer had, um, had a, a sort of a, 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 an extended exchange of letters um, with woes in the pages of, if I recall correctly, it was science might have been nature of science, I think, about whether morphology or molecular um, w- was the trumping. Uh, I should get, I should use a different word. <laughs> that, right. that word is that word is spoiled. <laughs> <That's right. laughs> was the preemptive was the preemptive uh, form of data, um, and they didn't agree on that. Yeah, really different styles too. It seems like so. You mentioned in one sort of. Um, profile of Lynn Margulis, this idea that she was science's unruly earth mother. Seems like a pretty different um, sort of approach to science than yeah. than was. Yeah, yeah, just for the record, though, let me clarify, that's yeah. not my phrasing. That's not my <laughs> no, 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 yeah. I quoted that statement from, I think, a magazine profile of, of Lynn. But yeah, she was, she was a, a big character. She was bigger than life. She was wonderful. Um, I only had essentially two days of her company, one on a bus going through Yellowstone National Park all day, and the other was when I went to, she invited me to come to um, uh, Southampton and, and sit in on her seminar there, which I did, which was a great pleasure. And then we went back to her house and you know, um, besides being a, a great, great scientist, she was everybody's Jewish mother. So she had she had stew waiting for us when we went went back to her. <laughs> house. Great. Yeah. yeah. How would you kind of compare their arcs of success, woes and marvelous, the in terms of recognition? So obviously, kind of coming at it with very different technical backgrounds, but also really different sort of career trajectories for the two. Yes, although some similarities. Mm-hmm. Um, Neither of them won a Nobel Prize. Both mm-hmm. of them, I think, would have liked to have and probably felt that it was merited. Um, Woes, at one point, um, he was 60, I think, before he was admitted to the to the National Academy of Sciences. And he was kind of um, disgruntled about that, partly because uh, Lynn had gotten in at about the age of 45, I think. Mm-hmm. Um, they um, – Lynn had a broader cultural uh, – 
impact. There were people who knew of her through her Gaia hypothesis, who didn't know beans about endosymbiosis, who thought that you know she was a great um, figure. She was a she was a very forceful teacher. She was a forceful debater. Things that Woes was not. Um, so she could strike out and and enter um, the popular discourse in a way that that woes could not um that was maybe maybe the most important difference i would guess between the two of them so moving a little further down um towards the i don't know last three quarters of the book we we hear you discuss at length how woes simply disliked darwin he was all wrong he in fact hated him he, yeah. he T- tell us a little bit about where that came from. Well, it's hard to, it's it's hard to know where it came from. It just sort of started appearing. I mean, part of it was that late in his life, I don't think he had paid much attention uh, to Darwin. Late in life, um, he had a had a um, uh, a very productive uh, professional partnership with a with a physicist at Illinois named Nigel Goldenfeld, um, and I think Nigel. Um, uh, persuaded him to start reading Darwin, read The Origin of Species, maybe which he had perhaps never read. Um, and then there was also a book that discussed, I mentioned the Alfred Wallace um, episode where Darwin and Wallace co-discovered the idea of natural selection. And some people argue, although it's a minority view, that um, Darwin connived with his powerful friends in England while well, Wallace was still an unknown young guy out in the Malay archipelago. Darwin connived to steal, quote unquote, this idea from Wallace and to say, take sole credit for it. Mm-hmm. I've written a lot about that interaction. I've written a lot about Wallace. Um, I don't believe that that's the correct view. I don't believe that's supported and neither do people like Janet Brown, the great Darwin biographer. Um, but some people hold that view, this crankish view that, oh, um, Darwin was um, was a, a, a cheat and a thief and he stole this idea from hmm. Alfred Wallace and elbowed him aside. And there's a book, um, not the best of the books about Alfred Wallace, but one of the books um, that um, that Woe's got a hold of, um, uh, I think it was written by a BBC producer named Roy Davies called The Darwin Conspiracy or something like that. And um, this became, um, a, I think, a grounding work for Woe's hatred of Darwin. He, he bought this completely, that Darwin had cheated Wallace. At the same time, he was coming to believe that he himself was a, a more radically innovative thinker than Darwin mm. himself, um, which is, um, you know, which was kind of, I mean, Woes was very, very important, but still that seems to me a symptom of a little bit of megalomania mm. um, to believe that he, uh, and I, and I, I present a couple of anecdotes about that, reflecting that attitude that he, he thought that he was more, more important um, to the history of evolutionary thinking than Darwin mm-hmm. himself. Um, and so, you know, 2009, we remember that was the Darwin bicentennial, February 12th, 2009, Darwin's 200th birthday, parenthetically, also Abraham Lincoln's 200th birthday, two guys born on the same day day, date in history. Um, so, uh, February 2009, Woes is sending people emails saying, today should be a day of rage. <laughs> wow. Yeah, wow. pretty dramatic. Yeah, that's, I wanted to run a maybe science history hypothesis by you, David, since you did all this uh, yeah. research on Woes and, his, and in this time of his life, sort of this turn against Darwin. I'm wondering if there's a possibility this might reflect a little bit this idea that, you know, Darwin is so iconic and he's had such a sort of major impact for very good reasons, but whether or not Mm -hmm. Woes might have seen this as sort of an impediment to scientific progress. And I'm borrowing a little bit from um, a story um, that was put forward by one of Vincent's colleagues, um, Stuart Firestein, in his book, which is called um, Failure, Why Science is So Successful. And he lifts up this um, second century philosopher, Galen, who is a um, philosopher and physician who had sort of the first dominant notion of how blood circulation works. And it was wrong. But 
this sort of Galen's view was so authoritative that it blocked any progress in physiology for something like 1500 years, just generation after generation, you know, tens of generations of physicians and scientists since then. And so is that possible that Wu's or sorry, Wu's uh, had some of this um, view that Darwin was sort of such a roadblock to sort of, or his, his ideas were sort of holding back other scientific progress, perhaps even his own, or is that sort of overreading it? No, I think that's uh, uh, that's very plausible, and it's probably part of it. Yeah, I I agree with that as as part of what illuminates this this attitude in woes. He also talked about the, the cult of personality, mm-hmm. cult of personality, um, with regard to Darwin. Um, although I think that if there had been a cult around his personality, he would have had <laughs> fewer objections to that, mm-hmm. uh, and to a lesser extent, I, I suppose there was. Um, but yeah. Um, but it's also the fact that, um, you know, 20th century uh, neo-Darwinism, the Darwinian synthesis, um, had uh, had trampled Lamarck into the ground. Had had come to the, you know, come to agreement that what what they were pleased to call Lamarckism, by which is somewhat in- imprecisely meant the inheritance of acquired adaptations. Mm-hmm. Um, that that was wrong, 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 and it was a you know it was a snake that refused to die, no matter how much you trampled on its head. L- l- these people kept bringing back that idea and calling it Lamarckism and saying Lamarck lives. Um, but um, and you guys know science history as well as I do. You know, twentieth century um, Darwinian synthesis. The I- certain ideas became canonical mm-hmm. within that understanding. Um, ideas in some cases that. Um, they, they they became canonical and categorical again categorical meaning absolutes you know um, evolution diverges it doesn't converge uh, uh, you know natural selection works on um, random tiny incremental variations to produce adaptations um, the inheritance of acquired characteristics and adaptations does not occur despite the fact that darwin himself in the origin of species was talking about the inheritance of acquired adaptations as an ancillary mechanism of evolutionary change in the section of the origin of species titled use and disuse what's use and disuse well that's giraffes stretching their necks um, <laughs> to get to high limbs and and then giving birth to calves with longer necks. So there is, quote-unquote, Lamarckism right there in the origin of species. But in the 20th century, there were some um, Darwinists who were, you know, more Catholic than the Pope, more <laughs> Darwinian than Darwin. Mm-hmm. And um, that's part of what I think Woes was reacting against in the late 20th century when he said, you know, we, we've just got we've just got to break through that. Um, Darwin, I would say, Darwin was hugely, hugely, hugely important and uh, and um, profoundly insightful and right about many hugely important things. But did he get everything solved? No. Was he right about everything that he claimed to have solved? No. His theory of of heredity, for instance. Um, so we don't have to say that Darwin was 100% right about all the thousand things that he said in order to give Darwin the the vast respect that he deserves. Um, I think maybe Woes was, was overreacting to that. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. No, I think it's really interesting, just this notion of, so as you're saying, like kind of getting, if you get the sort of the fundamentals right, and then the danger to maybe scientific progress is that it's sort of alluring then to just get stuck sort of filling in the details or the cracks sort of dotting the I's and crossing the T's versus yeah, how do you, and it's get, so hard mm-hmm. because, because um, I'm, I'm sorry, I interrupted. No, 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 go right ahead. Finish your thought. No, no. Well, it's so hard because scientists have careers. Yes. Scientists seek truth. They, and they have an excitement and a, and a deep, desire the best of them to make discoveries and not just have successful careers but they do have careers too and sometimes a career is based on a discovery a theory a hypothesis that that becomes important and that becomes confirmed and becomes canonized um and 40 years pass and um this person is getting fest shrifts and things and then new data appear suggesting that that hypothesis is just wrong well, look at the incentives against that scientist being able to say, okay, well, uh, 
never mind. Turns out I was wrong about that. Um, I mean, that's one of the things I love about Edward O. Wilson. Mm -hmm. Um, He remembers and has always stated that science is provisional. Theories are provisional. And when there's new data, sometimes you rethink them. Sometimes you rethink the idea of kin selection that may have been essential to, you know, your book Sociobiology in 1975. And now you see new data and you say, no, 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 I don't think it was kin selection after all. I think it was group selection. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, no, it's really fascinating to just the sort of arc of how science progresses and sort of this balance maybe or this tension between advancing an idea that ha- that where there's something to it so that it gets a foothold, but then being able to sort of productively let go of it or um, in a way that you're not sort of slipping back and losing it altogether, but still moving forward. You're not just sort of stuck in that space that's carved out by that idea. Seems like a, right. a really tough space to navigate um, and one that it looks like um, from your uh, description that Woes was getting a little bit trapped maybe as he was kind of getting closer to the end of his life. Yes, I think so. Because, um, again, to come back to ideas that become canonized, um, and I don't mean sainthood, I mean they become part of the you know canonical thinking, um, uh, the three domain tree of life. Um, in 1977, it was radical and outrageous. Um, by the turn to the 21st century, it was in textbooks, I believe. Anyway, it was commonly accepted. But then, here comes Ford Doolittle and Bill Martin and other people saying, hey, look, look at these, all these branches going sideways. Look at all this entanglement. Um, and and there's, it's not simply three major limbs that um, diverge to branches, that diverge to twigs. There's also all this horizontal stuff going on. Mm-hmm. Um, and Woe's recognized horizontal gene transfer as having been hugely important in the early history of life. But it seems that he was um, less ready, more reluctant to embrace it as an ongoing um, process phenomenon with great significance, and not just among bacteria and archaea, but even among eukaryotes. Because um, because people, as you know, to go back to where we started, mm-hmm. what Vincent was talking about, about in connection with Bill Martin, suddenly people were drawing these different images of the quote-unquote tree of life that were a whole lot less conventionally tree-like, and they didn't just have three great limbs. They had all this other stuff going on. Yeah, and that's where you spend the last part of the book talking about how we learned about horizontal gene transfer, starting from, you know, Griffith, learning that you could transfer properties and coming over yeah. to the present. It's a great, it's a great history. And I highly Fred Griffith, I, I love, the, I love the story of Fred Griffith, and then, you know, he discovers pneumococcus, you know, mm-hmm. um, uh, uh, non-virulent forms are capable of changing into virulent forms. How does that happen? And then Oswald Avery, with his two colleagues, comes along and, and says, well, it's this transforming principle. Um, it's, um, you know, it's probably, uh, it looks like a virus. It's probably a gene, is what Avery mm-hmm. wrote to his brother. And, um, and we find out, well, it's, it's DNA moving sideways across boundaries, um, between different kinds of bacteria, even different quote-unquote species of bacteria. Um, so, by the time you get to Francis, Francis Crick and, and James Watson in 53, you know, yay, hooray, they have solved the structure of DNA, but, but who proved that DNA was worth solving the structure of? Yeah, that's right. <laughs> um, who, who identified that as the genetic molecule? It was these other people. Yeah. In this discourse, you come across uh, Cedric Fischot, which is who is Nels's old colleagues there in, in Utah. Oh, Cedric! Yeah, wonderful work. Wow, I loved um, learning about Cedric's work and and talking with him about it about you know horizontal transposon transfer. Yeah, uh, you know, a whole section devoted to that. Fascinating work from him. And, and you were right next door to Nels, but you missed them. That's right. You're in the shadow of LD Lab Studios for. a brief. So Cedric and I, yeah, our labs actually were adjacent. Um, he left about a year or so ago um, for to move his lab to Cornell. I have to say, Cedric is yeah. almost like a transposable element of science. He hops from, <laughs> <laughs> hops from place to place. Yeah. Um, but we, yeah, yeah we've we're worked together. France to, France to Athens, Georgia to uh, 
to um, Salt Lake to Texas Ar- Arlington. Yep, and Texas Arlington Texas is too, another yeah. stop Texas, in, yeah. along the way as well. Yep. No, so Cedric and I have, yeah, we've worked together, continue to, so we co-advise um, some postdocs and his ideas on this, um, yep, horizontal transfer. This is sort of bubbling up in our laboratory, uh, the, not just LD Lab Studios, but LD Lab, um, some of the work there. And I just wanted to say, David, actually, I really thought the way you were weaving some of these um, strands together, um, in particular, with the, I think with the history of the evolution, where it's a field, as we talk about, um, from time to time on Twivo that sort of comes up from very little data, but like really big ideas and big personalities. Um, and the blending, the blending that now of um, the work like Griffith, the stuff that you're describing with where now there's actually a real experimental manipulation to figure out this property of transformation um, between bacterial species. And this is um actually kind of an organizing principle of Twivo are these collisions of approaches, the evolutionary with the experimental and how that's kind of hopefully ushering in this new era where you can do, you know, in addition with the tools and techniques, in addition to sort of the inferences, you can actually, you know, just ask a microbe to tell you how does this work and actually have your personality step aside a little bit. So anyway, I just wanted to say that I found, especially in the kind of the later part of the book as these, threads were sort of woven together, but even sort of fraying at the edges, as you talk about CRISPR, some of the other things coming up, it was really inspirational and got me thinking a little bit differently about some of the work that we're doing here, just to have it in that context. And so I wanted to thank you for that. It was really, really a fun read. Uh, Oh, music to my ears. Thank you very much, Nels. I appreciate that. Yeah. David, uh, later on, you you talk a bit about Norm Pace. Yeah, Norman. uh, I have a, a... a story that I think you might like. Uh, this comes from Hazel Barton, who was a cave microbiologist. Mm-hmm. And she spent some time with Norm. And she said early on when she was in his lab, she was trying to figure out what to do. Uh, she was sitting at her desk. And one morning he came in and he throws a shower curtain on her desk, a plastic <laughs> shower curtain covered with, you know, slime. Yeah. And he said, figure out what's on here. <laughs> That's great. And that was her that's project. Great. So she had to that's scrape Norm. it off and sequence it, right? Now. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. Yeah, that's great. Norm is a wonderful fellow and wonderful character and was very helpful to me in this book. He was he as he I quote him saying in the book, uh, he essentially was was Carl Woese's scientific son. He felt that way and it's pretty clear that Woese felt that way too. Um, when I started this book, early among my earliest moves were to make contact with Ford Doolittle. Turned out he was going to the ASM, big, you know, American Society of Microbiologists meeting, three or 4,000 people in Boston. Would you meet with me? Yes, Ford said he'd meet with me. So, um, we had dinner and we talked and talked and, and he said, yeah, essentially he, he endorsed the notion of this book project that I wanted to do. And then he said, oh, hey, I got to introduce you to Norm Pace. Here, there's Norm over there. Norm, this is, this is, David Quammen. So from the beginning, I had those two guys sharing thoughts with me, uh, and that continued, and that was extremely valuable. Um, and and Norm was the one who took Carl Woese's basic methodology and use of that Rosetta Stone molecule, and said, "Well, with this technique, we can find out." Um, things about living creatures without ever having to culture them in the laboratory. Mm-hmm. We can just find out what's out there. Hell, let's go to Yellowstone and and put a bucket in in um, one of the uh, one of the hot springs there and dip out some pink gunk and take it back uh, and sequence it. Uh, and and he did, and that's he became the um, the the godfather of environmental. Um, uh, you know, biodiversity censusing, yep, kind of the, um, which is why he was t- telling your friend, to, hey, please s- figure out what's on this shower yeah, curtain. That's right. Well, it's a si- it's a seismic change where we used to we grew up. You had to culture things and study them, so you were limited because not a lot of things would grow, and now you don't. You just sequence and find out what's there. Yeah, the emergence of right. metagenomics. Yep. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Now, yeah. I, I thought we could end up with a few kind of. General yeah. questions? Would that be okay? Of course, great idea. How are you holding up, David? We're just kind of peppering you with questions here. We don't. Want to- I'm, I'm good. I'm good, and the dogs haven't barked to go out and come in. That's- so I, I wanted to ask you about your, your research for the book. One of the things you did is is go to the the Carl Woese archive at the university, and is that something that you often do? To, and, and who do they have archives for? They're not going to have an archive on me. I'm pretty sure. 
not unless you've donated your papers to the University of Illinois. No. Um, well, they, um, I got, I got great hospitality and great cooperation, both from the the library people, the archive people at the University of Illinois, and from the um, the Institute for Genomic Biology, which is now known as the Carl R. Woese Institute for Genomic Biology, a great institution there in Urbana. So I went there a number of times uh, and read my way through the Woes archives and found some interesting things and got some insights about him. I tried to do that with Lynn Margulis, mm-hmm. too. Mm-hmm. I spent two days at the Library of Congress um, where there are some of her papers, but um, the rest of her papers are still privately held. Uh, I was wishing that somebody had written a biography of Lynn Margulis so I could read it and wouldn't have to, you know, do a biographical research chapter myself. Uh, nobody has done that yet, but I still hope somebody will. The biography of Lynn Margulis would be very valuable. Um, I did it more in this case because this book, by the nature of its subject, is more focused on databases and and laboratories and genomic um, information. Um, Usually when I write a book, I get the opportunity to walk around in jungles with scientists or climb around rooftops in Bangladesh or go into caves in southern China, and that helps that helps turn the narrative wheel. Uh, in this case, I didn't have that advantage. There. I had little if no opportunity to um, pick up some sort of an exotic disease or, mm-hmm. or fall into a hole or <laughs> get in trouble otherwise, get stomped on by a gorilla. Um, so, I, I needed… Uh, dimensions of storytelling to replace that, and and uh, so I went to the archives, among other things. I talked to a lot of scientists, and and as well. Yeah, you, that's the other thing I wanted to ask you. You actually go and you visit people as opposed to calling them on the phone. Why do you do that? Because I, f- because I get much more. Um, because uh, because I'm not a science reporter in the daily journalism sense with mm-hmm. a short. Um, short deadline, short timeline, um, uh, you know, breaking news. That's not what I do. I, I want the deep narrative. Um, so, by going places and saying, look, I want to, I, I really want to talk to you. So, if I come to Dusseldorf, Bill Martin, will you talk to me? Yeah. If I come to Paris, Thierry Heidemann, great scientist whose work I, I describe amazing work near the end of the book, Thierry Heidemann working on, um, on, um, captured uh, endogenous retroviruses in the human genome and the fact that some of them have really important functions. I started reading his work, Terry Heidemann's work. And I said, oh my God, uh, the book was about two-thirds written. I said, I think this is my ending. This guy's work is really important. Um, so, I read a bunch of his papers and I emailed him and I said, if I come to Paris from Bozeman, Montana, will you give me one hour and talk with me about your work? And he said, yeah, sure. So, I flew to Paris and um, we talked for seven hours and then I flew home and it was enormously cost-effective and productive. I got to see him. I got to talk to him. I got to drive across Paris with him. I got to see the decor of his lab. I got deep conversation. He essentially gave me a PowerPoint, gave me about a six-hour PowerPoint presentation on, on on the Mac on his desk with charts and graphs and um, it was much more than I could have gotten by phone. So you also do, so when you write it, you can see that you've been there, but you also write in a similar way about people that you've never met, right? And that who are dead. And so how do you do that? Well, um, by research, I, I care. I look for for those details, those human details, somebody like Fred Griffith uh, or Ivan mm-hmm. Wallen, mm-hmm. Uh, who was one of the early, or or, or Konstantin Marashovsky, this crazy Russian who um, who preceded Lynn Margulis in um, in propounding one of the um, cardinal pillars of endosymbiosis theory, um, chloroplasts in plants are captured bacteria, and he was this highly colorful, very disreputable guy knocking around the world and, and promoting this idea. Um, so, I've got a long section on, on him just because it's so bloody colorful. Mm. Um, uh, I, I, I just really like to in, include that stuff. Yeah, I, I have to say to the listeners that you just incorporate – it sounds like you're there talking to these people, right, Nels? Yeah, I agree. It's just- That's right. And, well, and I think, David, you even um, – 
uh, I pulled out one um, sentence or two that kind of gets at that. You, I think in the, your introduction, you just you know you're talking about science as a human activity. It's a process, not a body mm-hmm. of facts or laws, and it has the smudgy fingerprints of humanness all over it. There's there are some smudgy fingerprints with uh, some of these characters that you're describing for sure. Well, I hope so. I mean, a part of it goes back to um, one of the, one of the formative books I think in my reading about science, history of science, philosophy of science. Um, David Hull's great Science as a Process, which is a book I recommend to anybody who's got the time and the attention span to read, you know, six hundred pages on. Um, the foundational events in the battle between numerical taxonomy and and cladism mm-hmm. <laughs> that's just a that's just a case history for him writing about how science happens mm-hmm. science is not just hypothetical deductive and and uh, uh you know data gathering and hypothesis testing science is also um clicks that form in the editorial offices of scientific journals. It's drinking beer in the corridors of a hotel during a scientific meeting. It's, um, you know, it's, it's marriages and divorces and affairs and ambition and jealousy and uh, resentment. Uh, it's all those things. It's, it's as human as, as I say, I guess, in the book. It's, it's a human activity like, like ballet, major league baseball, or grandmaster chess. And it's got humanity all over yeah. it, which is what makes it fun to read about. How's the book doing? How's the Tangled Tree being received? It's it's doing well. Great. I, th- we're, I think we're very happy. I mean, it had a cup of coffee on the bestseller list. Mm-hmm. Um, it was long listed for the National Book Award, although it didn't make the short list. Um, it's been well reviewed with a few, um, a few pot shots, a few criticisms, but that's, you know, that's part of the game. I, I understand that. And it's been enormously um, well embraced by both people within the scientific world and and people um, daring curious readers who say, "Hey, I think I'm going to read a book about uh, the history of molecular phylogenetics." Um, that's, yeah, that's right. I, that's I, great. I, I tell myself, whatever whatever you say about this book to a general audience, <laughs> don't say it's a it's a 400 page history of molecular yeah, right. phylogenetics. That's, right. no, that's yeah, yeah. people. That's not that's not at all <laughs> what it is. No, that's not what it is. It's a book about the most important biologist of the 20th century that you've never heard of. Well, it's a good one. And for what it's worth, I would say add it to the Twivo um, list of highly recommended books. For sure. Great. And, and everyone, Great. everyone go out and, and buy it and uh, you'll get a bump there with all the podcasts uh, that we do. Uh, we're going to give you a nice bump in your sales. Vincent and Nell's um, <laughs> blessings on you and all your offspring to the seventh generation. <laughs> I want to, uh, also say how much I like the last sentence of the book. Some had arisen straight and some had arrived sideways. If and, and if you read the book, you'll get it. And actually, you can get it from what we've said today. That's right. Uh, for sure. Yeah. These things are not accidental. Yeah. You, try and, you try and convey meaning to the last word. Now, should we wrap it up? Yeah, let's wrap it up. I'm, um, I know, so you and I in our show notes had about a million questions. We covered not, you know, all of them, but I think we, a really fun conversation. Um, pick up the book because there's so much depth and detail that we have not even scratched the surface of. We usually do science picks of the weeks. So we're running, running a little long, but I do want to just, I do still have one, Vincent, a science pick of the sure. week. I can't resist. This is um, in, I think it's chapter 69 of Tangled Tree. A fellow called Axel Erlinson shows up. He's a <laughs> Swedish farmer from yeah, Minnesota. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Settles near Santa Cruz and starts what he calls the tree circus. So this is um, sort of breeding trees or growing trees, actually, and um, sort of manipulating them to into these like crazy mixed up shapes, which obviously echoes on some of the scientific ideas of the metaphor of the tree. So I did a quick Google search and found Gilroy Gardens, um, which has about two dozen of Erlinson's original trees transplanted mm. nearby Santa Cruz. We've got a little uh, link there. Check it out. Some of these wild, um, crazy forms that he was able to breed and sort of do as like you know full scale, um, uh, full scale bonsai or something like that. It's really he, wild. He he demonstrates that that if not in the wild, in captivity, trees can be tangled. He was a great tangler of trees. That's great. There you go. Yeah. That's Twivo 37. You can find it at microbe.tv slash Twivo 
or wherever fine podcasts are served. And you probably listen on your favorite podcast app on your phone or tablet. If you do, please subscribe so you get every episode and it helps us to get the subscription numbers. And if you really like what we do, consider contributing. We have a number of ways you can do that. Go over to microbe.tv slash contribute. And as always, questions and comments to Tweevo at microbe.tv. Our guest today has been David Quammen. You can find him at davidquammen.com. And as I said, go out and buy all of his books. Thanks so much, David. Vincent Nels, thank you. What what fun. What a what an enjoyable conversation. Thank you, David. Enjoyed it as well. Nels Eldies at Cellvolution.org. You can find him on Twitter as L Early Bird. Thanks, Nels. Thank you, Vincent. Good as always to be in the company of uh interesting folks. I'm Vincent Racaniello. You can find me at virology.ws. Music on Twivo is by Trampled by Turtles. They're at tramplebyturtles.com. <laughs> You've been listening to This Week in Evolution, the podcast on the biology behind what makes us tick. Thanks for joining us. We'll be back next month. Till then, be curious. I think I've got the dogs placated with some treats. The cat is locked out of the office, and it's just uh, me and Boots the Python who has emerged from his hooch and starting to wake up and prowl around. I'm going to turn off uh, my video, and you should too. Do you know how to do that, David? I think I can figure it out. Hold on this here. Is the con- conserve bandwidth. Good. Yeah. Turn mine Does that on. do it? Yep. I always need to conserve bandwidth. <laughs> yeah, I understand. I once was... David, have you ever heard of uh, Bonnie Bassler? Uh, I don't think so. Bonnie Bassler, no. Well, you'll Doesn't probably you'll probably run into her one someday. You're going to write a book on quorum sensing, I bet. Probably so, yeah. And she's a uh, one of the big movers, and uh, oh. so she's pretty dynamic. And she's at Princeton. Anyway, she's giving a talk once, and her laptop on the screen. All of a sudden, this dialogue box came up, said, your battery is fully charged. And she looks at it and she goes, I'm always charged. (laughs) (laughs) Good. She's quick. That's good. Yeah, that's a, that's a prerequisite being quick. Yeah. Yeah. Not everyone is, unfortunately. (laughs) (laughs) And not all the time. Hey, here's the latest update in from Ebola from ProMed. Uh What's the latest? Uh, NPR said this morning that more than 100 people had died. My count is 215 or something like that. This is in DRC, right? Yeah. And what's the yeah. total count, case count so far? Um, three, 341 with 215 mm-hmm. deaths. That's, that's so much for, well, no, I can't say so much for ring vaccination, but so much for whatever therapies we've developed. Recently, well, you know, still- the problem is that the, uh, people are suspicious of the government, and so they don't want to take yeah. the vaccine, right? That's what I've heard anyway. Yeah, no, you're right. And that's Absolutely. too bad, because I think the vaccine uh, is probably effective, although, yeah. you know, they haven't done all the right trials. Right, yeah. And the vaccine, I mean, the fact that the case number is 341, without the vaccine, maybe that's 641. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's yeah. hard to know. Yeah. Have you ever... Have you ever uh, worked or traveled in DRC? Nope. Difficult place. Yeah, you've yeah. been, I guess, right? Yeah, yeah. Difficult even without an Ebola outbreak. David, I travel via you these days. <laughs> well, did you have a good time in uh, Mozambique last week? <laughs> and I read your books, and I, uh, you go to a lot of places I just don't go to. I go to the standard, you know, Europe and all over the U.S., but you go to different places. Yeah, I like those different places. And I, I mean, I was reading. So before I, I read Tangled Tree, I, I went back and reread uh, Song of the Dodo. Oh, and, um, oh, thank you. I can't remember where you were, but you were looking for something by yourself and you camped out and you got sick and you made yourself throw up and then you felt better. I'm thinking, my God, this guy is brave. <laughs> <laughs> I don't remember that. I don't remember where that was. Um, Could yeah. have been a lot of places. 
it, it's a place where you went and um, maybe looking for these tiny lemurs, I think, or some tiny monkey uh, that no, nobody had seen. And uh, yeah, it's, I, that's actually something I wanted to ask you. Do you remember all the stuff you write? I guess the answer is no. <laughs> <laughs> no, I remember a lot, but uh, no, yeah. Uh, I, w- I was talking with Jerry Quaish about um, spillover, and I had mm-hmm. to review because he's, you know, he's teaching this course. Uh, it's a Harvard, a kind of, a kind of a Harvard elder hostel thing. You know, his mm-hmm. average mm-hmm. student age is probably about seventy, um, which means, of course, lots of attention span and doing homework and things like that, motivation. And he wanted; they wanted to mostly talk about spillover. And I thought, wow, what what do I remember about yeah, spillover? That's, that's right. Are are not Cormac and McKendrick? Uh, <laughs> yeah, that's the thing. You probably well, I from my own perspective, I forget a lot. You know, I read yeah. a paper, and and two weeks later, I can't remember details. And Vincent, thank you for saying that. I'm <laughs> glad to hear that. Yeah, it's hard, and I'm uh, especially yeah. with this podcasting now. I'll believe. Oh, I remember there was this thing. And I, I can't remember it, but it's related yeah. to what we're talking about. <laughs> yeah, right. There was this thing, and there was a worm, and and somebody did a study, and can't it was remember amazing. the details. Yeah, and and I leave it in the podcast, and sometimes people will write in and say, "This is what you meant." <laughs> yeah, that's helpful. Yeah, it's good. Hive mind is better there, and actually, totally, forgetting totally. Before, otherwise, if you hold on to everything, you're that's a, a curse, not a blessing. Hive mind. That's nice. That's, I like that. Yeah that term before hive mind that's like that's like the wisdom of the crowd and group sourcing right mm-hmm. yeah yep yeah well we we do a lot of group sourcing on our podcasts you know people will ask us a question we say we don't know does somebody know and then by the next episode we have it that's i really like that that is that's good yeah 